Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We'll get started in just a couple moments. We'll give folks just about one more minute to join and we'll get started. But good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. If you'd like, you can go ahead and put in the chat where you're signing in from. We're so glad you're here. Marion County's in the house, Tucson, Arizona, Milwaukee, Washington, DC. Welcome, welcome. All right, well, good afternoon or good morning. I know we're still admitting some folks, but we're so glad you're here. Whether it's your first time on an NCSD call or your 101st, you're in the right place. Um, to get us started here, I'm gonna introduce uh, David Harvey, Executive Director of NCSD. David? Good morning, uh, everybody, and thank you for joining the call today. Boy, do we have a great turnout for this call this morning and an incredible geographic uh, representation <laughs> from throughout the country of those of you who serve in the Oh, sorry, David, I accidentally muted you. <laughs> I apologize. Oh, all right, I'll start over again. No guarantees it'll be as good the second go around though. Anyway, good good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for the latest session that we are doing on uh, our nation's latest response uh, to this infectious disease outbreak of monkeypox. Um, I don't have to tell you about the incredibly crucial and important role you all play um, as DIS in responding to this issue. And, and of course, today we will be taking stock of what's going on around the country in terms of the DIS role in monkeypox uh, and contact tracing. So the first thing I want to do is just to thank you uh, for the work that you do every day uh, and this important and crucial role that you play within the public health system. I think as you all know, monkeypox is a rapidly evolving situation. Uh, over the weekend and just this morning, there has been uh, some very important media coverage around monkeypox uh, in relation to our field, the STD field. And I think you may also be aware that NCSD has called for more resources, particularly for STD clinics uh, who are playing and can play a crucial role in uh, in the future response. Uh, but we think that more money is obviously needed to support uh, this response. Congress, uh, through COVID monies, uh, allocated additional funding for DIS. And uh, this latest infectious disease outbreak speaks to the wisdom of that investment. Jurisdictions across the country are taking steps to hire more DIS, and there's a lot of work going on, as you all know. Uh, some quick resources to note, NCSD's website, we have a monkeypox command center, please check it out. Uh, it is updated every day with the latest information on what's happening. We also recently did a survey of STD clinics around monkeypox capacity. This is the first data that has been collected nationally on what's going on uh, with local clinics as they look to ramp up their response. A very important set of data uh, that NCSD is using to advocate for resources. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen Full. Thank you, uh, Jenny, and thanks to all the members uh, uh, who are joining us who are speaking today today during the webinar. Uh, really appreciate all your efforts of joining us today. So Kathleen Full, take it away. Thank you. 
Thank you, David. Yeah, and we are going to um, have a monkeypox update from Dr. Phil Chan. Um, Dr. Chan is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and School of Public Health at Brown University and infectious diseases phys physician. Dr. Chan is also chief medical officer at Open Door Health, the state's only community-based LGBTQ plus clinic, as well as a medical director for the Rhode Island Department of Health. Um, and I will send it over to you, Dr. Chan. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thanks, Jenny, for organizing all this. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, happy to talk about uh, monkeypox for a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to provide kind of a broad level overview where we are over the next five, 10 minutes, and then we'll uh, hand it off to some of the DIS here. And I just want to echo what David said, actually, which is thank you for all your work. So I do uh, help uh, with uh, DIS as well at our local health department, and I just don't underestimate uh, being on the front line. So thank you all for being there, for doing the work. And uh, we're on to monkeypox. So here's the latest news. So last week, uh, the WHO did declare monkeypox a pandemic, uh, given that the widespread uh, outbreak across uh, the world. Uh, the WHO also met on June 25th, um, and they talked about, uh, they stopped short of declaring it a public health emergency. Um, and I think the latest case counts from across the world are more than 4,000 cases across 47 countries. Many of those are from the European region, but as uh, as we'll talk about in a second, there's been some under testing uh, here in the US. And I think what is still striking, and this is part of how my thinking has evolved too, is that we're still seeing the vast majority of cases among males, cisgender males, uh, and the majority of those are among MSM. Of all the studies that I've reviewed over the last few days, there's a number in preprint, there's a number that have been published, there's a number of technical reports that have been released from the UK and elsewhere, is it really set, It really uh, points to the fact that this, um, that this uh, outbreak is still focused and localized uh, among MSM, and that the majority of this is really, uh, is really uh, presenting with STI symptoms, symptoms, rashes, lesions around the genital area. Uh, based on the worldwide uh, pandemic, there have been very few hospitalizations, which is good. Some of you may remember the early reports talked about potentially some strains of monkeypox had a 10% mortality rate. Uh, we thought that this one was around 1%. And the WHO did mention uh, that there is one death that has been reported in an immunocompromised individual. So that is the first death that I'm aware of, not in the US, uh, as far as I know. Uh, there's some early data coming out about the reproductive number. Uh, it's thought that in general, the reproductive number is less than one for most folks, but maybe, but is slightly greater than one among MSM. And that spreads to the fact that it's uh, it's been spreading in that population. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, the CDC, uh, you know, has uh, mentioned many times now, and it, it looks like that the virus is being spread primarily through direct contact with infectious rash. Uh, lesions, body fluids, et cetera. And this is different than what we initially thought. I remember sitting down with my state epidemiologist uh, here in Rhode Island, Dr. Bandy, who's been doing this for 29 years. The initial thinking about monkeypox was that it was going to be droplet transmission potentially. And that can still happen. Uh, but what we're seeing just by the nature of the lesions, of course, the rashes, uh, is that it really seems to be direct contact many times during sex uh, with infectious fluids, rash, et cetera. You can also get it from respiratory secretions during what we're calling prolonged face-to-face -face contact or intimate physical contact, such as kissing, cuddling, uh, sex. I think what's reassuring though, and I do want to reassure folks, is that this does not appear anywhere near as infectious, of course, as uh, COVID, since that's what we're, we're comparing everything to lately. Um, so that's good. And we are seeing, again, direct uh, contact skin-to-skin uh, uh, -skin is kind of the main way. Uh, also spent some studies that have looked at the incubation period. Uh, you know, there's a study from the Netherlands that really confirmed that it in general is eight and a half days. That's incubation period uh, ranging anywhere from four to 17 days. So the public health guidance that the incubation period is up to 21 days uh, seems to hold true uh, for uh, currently available data. And certainly there's more emerging as we speak. Uh, in terms of what's happening in the U.S., uh, we are as of uh, uh, Friday afternoon, when the last case counts were reported, we're seeing 200 cases. Uh, there's been five states that have reported double digits. Uh, California has 51 cases, New York 35, Illinois 26, Florida 16, and Massachusetts 12. All other states, uh, including Rhode Island, uh, report a lower count. We have one case here in the state of Rhode Island. Um, the people who are at risk of monkeypox, 
you know, if you look at the CDC guidance, it's talking about certainly if someone has a rash, it looks consistent. If you're traveled outside the U.S. to a country with confirmed cases of monkeypox um, or had contact with a dead or live wild animal or exotic pet um, from Africa. But there are other big criteria. And the one that we all need to keep in mind uh, is skin to skin contact with someone in a social network experiencing monkeypox activity. And this includes men who have sex with men who meet partners through an online website, app, or social event, such as a bar or party. Uh, and that is, again, based on the fact that we're seeing the majority of symptoms. The other thing that David sort of touched on that's, uh, that's uh, coming out is that there's becoming increasing pressure to ramp up testing, uh, specifically uh, expanding to commercial labs. We saw this actually as a major limitation, right? In the early, in the early phases of the COVID pandemic, it was very difficult in the U.S. to get a COVID test. Uh, and I think lessons learned, uh, it was released uh, last week that the CDC is looking to expand monkeypox testing uh, to some commercial labs. Uh, they specifically mentioned Quest, Sonic Healthcare, LabCorp, Mayo Clinic, um, and Aegis Sciences. And these are some of the major healthcare systems in the U.S. So that will greatly facilitate testing. Uh, I think we're expecting it sometime in July, I think date TBD. Uh, but I think that this will be a, a huge boon. And as many of you know, sort of the guidance from many of our public health departments has been, uh, you know, you got to call us, we'll do an investigation, then we'll let you know whether or not we approve testing. Uh, the way that we're moving towards is to really make this, uh, is to really loosen restrictions on testing. And I think that, that that's important. Um, the data is showing uh, that this is spreading. There's many, I think, as we all can imagine, there's many un unrecognized cases of monkeypox out there. And we have to loosen the restrictions on testing to be able and reduce the barriers uh, to be able to accurately diagnose uh, and recognize these cases. So the way that we're moving over the next few weeks, couple months, will be to push this into the clinical sector, um, to certainly include this as part, in my opinion, as part of routine STI testing in the right setting, someone with symptoms consistent with monkeypox, if you um, have oh, lesions. Look at it. It looks like testicles. a camera's right back. Oh, it? Hey, it does. With a sprinkler head on the top? Wow. Unmute here. So that's where we're going with this, I think, is that we are expecting and will see a lot of additional testing, including through commercial labs uh, in the near future. And I think that that's a great step and needed uh, a needed step forward. The other thing that some of you may be aware, and there may be some re representatives uh, from New York on here, but there are specifically New York City, uh, but Montreal as well, some other uh, international uh, countries. Um, are starting to vaccinate higher risk populations, which this time focus on MSM, of course. And so just to remind folks that there are two vaccines available uh, for that are FDA uh, uh, approved for monkeypox. One is the ACAM 2000, one is the Genios vaccine. Uh, all of us, I think, physicians who are up to date on this would really discourage the ACAM 2000 vaccine. There's a lot of side effects. Um, there's very significant side effects with the ACAM 2000. It's a live replicating vaccinia virus. Uh, just to remind people is that, you know, within the orthopox virus, uh, family of viruses is that if you have, if you are immune to one of those viruses, you're actually it confers immunity to a whole bunch of them. So in these vaccines are using something called the vaccinia virus, which is a, uh, an orthopox virus that causes uh, pox disease in other animals, but it is benign for humans. And that's why we use it, just FYI. The Genios vaccine is a lot is a live, but non-replicating uh, vaccine of virus vaccine. And it does not have uh, the side effects uh, that the, uh, the ACAM 2000. So I think my personal opinion recommendation strongly discouraged the ACAM 2000 vaccine. The Genio vaccine is where we need to go. Um, the US is, and the company itself uh, based out of Europe is ramping up for uh, production. Uh, again, the Genios, I think what's important, and I've gotten some feedback about this, we vaccinated a handful of folks uh, here in Rhode Island. Most people actually didn't realize it's a two-dose vaccine given 20 days apart. That's something we may want to remind people if we start rolling it out. People thought it was a one-time thing. It is not a one-time thing. Uh, it is two shots. And just to also say that we have limited data of these vaccines. Uh, the data does suggest that, this, that these vaccines are at least 85% effective in preventing monkey, monkeypox. Uh, but Again, limited data, we'll know more. Um, and then the other thing too, I will point out is that these vaccines can be given as post-exposure uh, prophylaxis to prevent the onset of disease. So it's thought, it's recommended that you give them it, uh, up to four days after. You can give them past four days, they may be less effective. The current guidance says try to give them within four days uh, to high-risk exposures um, uh, to prevent disease. And 
Uh, so I think much more to come. I think where the field is going with monkeypox is that as vaccines ramp up is that we will start vaccinating um, segments and offer be offering this to higher risk MSM uh, who may be at risk. And I think that that's where we need to head personally. Um, I've also been careful, you know, over the last couple of months, I just want to state to be transparent about this as someone that serves uh, in the leadership role of an LGBTQ clinic. I've been very careful myself to uh, and how I message monkeypox, because of course, we do not want to stigmatize the LGBTQ population, specifically gay and bisexual men. Uh, but the data is really becoming clear uh, that this population continues to be affected. Uh, at first, I was, you know, I, I had a strong thought that this was where there are un under recognizing cases in other subsets of the population. But I think what's becoming increasingly recognized about monkeypox is that because of the dense sexual network specifically, and there's now starting to be some data and studies on, on this, uh, is that it's really those dense sexual networks among gay and bisexual men that are seem to be spreading this to a higher degree. And if you look at some of the, the demographics of case reports and the UK, for example, released some data, um, it, it's almost the majority of them are MSM. And if you drill down to who's more at risk, you know, the majority of folks are reporting more than 10 sexual partners. Uh, you know, um, this one report said 44% reported group sex during the incubation period. So it's really some of these uh, having multiple partners. And it's believed that these kind of dense sexual networks are what are really facilitating transmission. And I, I think at this point in time, this is my personal opinion, is that we're starting to do a disservice a little bit by not uh, focusing and pushing, uh, uh, you know, at least education awareness, if not interventions like vaccination among MSM, we need to start to ramp it up. It's if we continue to uh, to not push this and 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 do what we can in public health, then I think we're doing a disservice to that community because it, it the projections, the modeling, uh, expert opinion is that it's only going to continue to spread and specifically among the MSM community unless we get out there and do a little bit more. So. I'll end on those thoughts. Uh, again, I'm still learning like you all are. Uh, you know, there's so much to learn, such limited data. Again, moving target. But thank you all again for joining and thank you NCSD for hosting. Great, thank you, Dr. Chan. We appreciate you coming on and providing that update. Um, I saw some great questions in the chat and we will have an opportunity to discuss those at the end. Um, but right now we're going to hear from our voices from the field. Uh, first, we will hear from Scott Strobel of Kansas. Um, Scott has worked in the Kansas Department of Health and Environment's Bureau of Disease Control and Prevention for over 10 years. As the STI HIV Disease Interventions Section Chief, he is responsible for the planning, implementation, and evaluation of the statewide sexually transmitted infection program, ensuring that program activities are performed in compliance with guidelines and technical procedures as established by KDHE and the Centers of D Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you so much. And Scott, I will hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, Kathleen. Um, yeah, so just uh, given a, a, a little bit of an update on, on where we are in terms of um, monkeypox and our, our preparations. So um, Kansas does not yet have a confirmed or probable case. Um, our colleagues in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, recently had uh, a a probable case, so like so many things, it's it's probably I mean it's definitely on its way. And as as uh, many of you are aware, cases are probably underreported due to the the lack of um, easy access to testing. So um, we are continuing to to keep our ear close to the ground on that. Um, in so doing, uh, the first thing that I did to uh, prepare our DIS uh, was to provide a brief, um, you know, a, a few weeks ago, we did a brief educational session, talked about um, clinical manifestations of monkeypox, what those lesions look like, and how they compare to the more common um, ulcerative STIs, so that the DIS, because when we get a case, it's probably going to hit our radar first. Um, and because STIs, the presence of an STI does not preclude, uh, you know, um, a, a concomitant infection of monkeypox as well. It's important for uh, our folks to know when they are asking those questions. An important first step of a syphilis case is to contact a provider and ask a bunch of questions about what is or is not known, what kind of history, 
was taken and, and the presentation of any symptoms that were reported or observed. So being able to uh, ask the right questions, either of a provider or the patient in an interview um, to ascertain, is this something that is really characteristic of syphilis or is this something that's behaving differently? Um, and of course, as you're all aware, syphilis can present in a variety of ways. So it really makes this task um, as complex as it is critical to identifying these cases early uh, and making sure that we're able to provide you know, whatever level of response we're able to. So first thing we did and, and something that um, I, I, I continue to sort of um, ask for at the, at the national level is we need to have a, like a solid uh, differential tool to, to go through the, the difference of the lesions between syphilis, monkeypox, uh, herpes, and then for those of you that have, you know, other uh, more you know, larger morbidities for things like LGV or uh, chancroid or um, cranuloma inguinale, like so that you're able to know, okay, well, if it's like this, then it could be any number of these things. But to be able to narrow that down, um, and for us in a centralized, a relatively centralized state, the DIS are the best uh, point of impact to start with, and then we we start, you know, doing uh, provider education. Uh, to get that information out to the to the clinicians that are seeing patients. Um, the other thing that uh, I've stressed with the DIS is that, again, right now, before we have a confirmed infection, um, paying attention to that stuff and brushing up on your interview skills now that uh, you probably have let lax, right? So uh, something that just happens as humans. Uh, we get complacent, we sort of form habits of what does and does not work for us in our personal interviewing styles. Um, but things that, you know, are sort of common to get glossed over when you focus on an STI interview are things like travel history, um, where they're staying, um, the, that, that social, um, social history portion of the interview with work, hobbies, hangouts, stuff like that, that all becomes much more important um, when you are trying to ascertain what's going on. So we've already had a couple of cases in Kansas where we, we suspected that, okay, well, this isn't ex behaving exactly like syphilis and the syphilis test is negative. So what are we going to do? And the first thing I'm asking is, okay, well, recent travel history you know, what, what's their, you know, do they, are they reporting sex with men? Are they uh, reporting contact with anyone else with similar lesions? And these are things that in those instances, we had not collected all of that information, um, you know, despite uh, me saying like, hey, travel history, work history, these other more casual exposure types that are going to be something that's going to be important to make these determinations as to whether or not somebody's um, you know, been at an increased risk, especially, you know, until we get the, the testing requirements um, opened up is going to be really important um, to start building those habits now before we are faced with having to do contact tracing investigations um, for the cases that eventually filter in. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let the, the next speaker go and uh, remain available for questions. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, our next speaker is Abel Martinez. Abel is the Deputy Sec Section Chief of the California Department of Public Health's STD Control Branch Disease Intervention Section. Abel has six years of experience conducting disease intervention activities, providing case investigation and mentorship on HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea, and most recently COVID-19. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Abel. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Um, yes, much like um, the previous speaker, um, a lot of the work from the California Department of Health has really just been focused on preparation um, in efforts to support our local health jurisdictions um, at, at the local level. Um, currently, uh, CDPH, uh, we've, you know, we received our notification of our first monkeypox um, at the end of May. And since then, um, we've mobilized to build surge capacity for contact tracing and efforts to assist the local health jurisdictions. Um, our SCD control branch disease intervention unit has partnered with our COVID-19 disease intervention unit 
uh, in efforts to uh, uh, collaborate and expand our response to develop uh, strike teams um, if and when our local health jurisdictions um, request that assistance. Uh, currently, we have a strike team that consists of uh, 15 COVID-19 disease intervention specialists um, that have been with us for the last couple of years as we uh, built up that support. Um, some of the process of what we did in efforts to uh, in, in efforts to gather the personnel that would be most comfortable with um, working, shifting from uh, COVID-19 um, to, to monkeypox response was uh, assessing to see whether or not uh, anyone had any previous experience with um, STDs, HIV, um, and also just conducting an assessment with existing staff. Um, from there, we were then able to bring that staff in um, and partner them with our, e our existing STD control branch um, disease intervention specialists. Um, for the last couple of weeks, um, our, uh, the COVID-19 disease investigation unit have been working on self-paced modules, um, ranging from passport to partner services, cultural humility and other you know, rel rel uh, imperative related, related trainings. Uh, we've also built up our existing capacity with our, uh, in our partnership with the University of California, San Francisco to further develop um, modules and role play sessions within our virtual training uh, academy um, that was in essence uh, a, a piece of our COVID-19 response. And so now we're just expanding that um, to build up skill sets for um, those potential DIS to respond uh, in, in those events. Our, um, we've been able to coordinate with and, and utilize, like I mentioned, our existing STD control staff to provide mentorship to those, those staff and build up those skill sets in the capacity and meeting with them weekly um, for uh, when we get those response. Uh, what we're looking at is providing, uh, you know, a sexual health assessments, navigating um, the monkeypox case report forms and interview guides and working with them collaboratively to get them comfortable with having all of that support. We are looking at providing local health jurisdictions, possible strike teams between three to eight people, um, at, a max, at a maximum of two week rotations, we're trying to not uh, to, to, to cycle it out to, to make sure that we sort of reduce the burnout as we previously had from COVID-19 and making sure that um, we're providing um, our staff to, the, to, the, to their best of their capacity to be able to assist our local health jurisdictions. And all of our deployments are still going to be in a virtual capacity and are all reliant on our local health jurisdictions um, to, to provide those requests if or when they're needed. Um, we have also been working in, um, in conjunction to, uh, to, to, to build up that capacity, but then providing contact tracing and investigation. All of our local health jurisdictions have been conducting that on their own. And what we have seen um, as far as the biggest challenges in the field is that a lot of the, the, the con patients and, and their sexual partners um, a, a lot of it is in uh, is contacting anonymous sex partners, and so that seems to be the challenge and the barrier of working with that. We're also looking at possibilities of expanding our current um, uh, our current system that we utilize for COVID nineteen to be able to utilize and send um, uh, uh, SMS messaging and stuff like that to be able to maximize our existing infrastructure to expand on um, that from COVID nineteen. Uh, onto uh, monkeypox response. No, and there. Let the next person speak. Thank you. Great, thank you, Abel. Um, our next speaker is Rebecca Scranton from Arizona. Um, Rebecca, if you would like to share some of your experiences as well, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Hi everyone, this is Rebecca. Um, so far we have had one confirmed case in our jurisdiction and it's not quite aligning with some of the uh, demographics that we're seeing nationwide. So we're still taking a rather, um, you know, obviously focusing on making sure we're communicating with clinics that 
could potentially encounter these cases, especially given the um, atypical presentation. So uh, we've been doing a lot of work with provider outreach in our jurisdiction, making sure we're getting message about messages about clinical webinars to our provider communities, um, in particular our STI specialty clinics. Um, in terms of DIS strategies at this time, really what we've been focusing our efforts are on are ensuring that all of our investigators at the local level are kind of aware and brushed up on strategies for eliciting some of the uh, key pieces of information that are highlighted in the case investigation forms um, and learning from the strategies that our STI investigators are so well um, versed in. Um, we are a home rule jurisdiction, so a lot of that initial investigative work would happen at the county level, not at the state level, um, but we do have our uh, state rapid response team working on scaling up uh, investigation forms in our uh, Qualtrics, yes, our Qualtrics survey uh, tool, which was used early in the COVID response um, for doing COVID investigations. So we're getting those case report forms in. Um, and although we have not formally scaled up our HEOC, uh, we do have a tentative structure in place and are having uh, meetings where STI leadership is being pulled into some of those discussions. Um, should we see more cases, which, you know, is very, very possible as always. Um, so that's kind of where we're, where we're at in Arizona. Great, thank you. Um, and our final speaker is Bryce Furness. Uh, Bryce is a medical epidemiologist with the CDC's DSTDP, who has been embedded within the Washington DC DOH since 2002. Um, Bryce, if you would like to share some of your experiences, that would be great, thank you. Yeah, sure. I am, um, I'm actually sitting in exam room number four of the DC Health and Wellness Center, and I'm gonna, I'll couch, everything that I say is couched in that, I'm um, part of the 2020 multinational monkey rock pox response at the national level. I'm leading one of the task forces of the response, but then I'm also very involved with what's going on locally, um, being one of the providers at the DC Health and Wellness Center. So I wanted to give an overview of what's going on in DC. So far, we've had 10 cases. I think it's something like seven confirmed and three positive, but I will be very clear that in the United States of America with uh, hundreds of tests that have been confirmed, there has not been an incidence yet of an orthopox positive case at an LRN lab that was then not monkeypox positive at CDC. So we have about 10 cases in DC. At the DC Health and Wellness Center, we have sent specimens on 14 patients that we've seen, um, and of those 14, six have come back positive. So of the 10 patients in DC, six have been diagnosed at the DC Health and Wellness Center. And we've also provided more than 54 doses of the Genios vaccine for post-exposure prophylaxis. So um, the DI specific things that I wanted to say is that when this first started, there, were just, there was a decision way up the food chain that the communicable diseases investigators were gonna take the contact tracing with this. Um, it did not fall on the HIV STI folks who have a lot of history with that. I have been pleasantly surprised with the work that the communicable disease DIS are doing, and I'll give two examples. Um, there are certain high-risk events that have led to local transmission here in Washington, D.C. One was an event at a local bathhouse that had X number of participants we don't know yet, but we do know transmission occurred there. Another was a Norgy that was organized through one of the internet service providers that men often use to meet dates and um, partners, basically. And that particular internet service provider, um, the disease intervention specialist that's working in the communicable diseases that isn't normally comfortable or used to asking very detailed sexual health questions, has established a profile on that internet service provider and has communicated with and engaged with all 12 of the men that participated in that orgy. So I was a little leery when this first started off because this, this infection, this outbreak, which seems to be sexually associated, we don't have evidence that it's sexually transmitted yet, which means we don't yet have evidence um, that it's the virus is evident in ejaculate, pre-ejaculate, and vaginal fluids, but we do know that it's transmitted through intimate contact, which includes sex, skin-to-skin -skin contact, large respiratory droplets that can be shared through spittle or spit or kissing um, and cuddling. 
So, but I've been pleasantly surprised. I've communicated with them multiple times. We've actually met a couple times and they're doing a really good job, all things considered. But the one thing I just wanna remember is that even though um, it seems to be affecting in general gay, bisexual and other men who have sex with men, I think it's becoming obvious the more case reports that are turned in from the local areas into the national level and also what's gone on a little bit in, in Europe is that there seem to be two subpopulations that are particularly affected, the BDSM community and those that involve that, that engage in chemsex. Um, and both of the events in DC um, were chemsex centered, if you will. So I think that's all I have. Great, thank you, Bryce. And I wanna say a big thank you to all of our speakers for sharing their insight and experiences. Um, we're now going to take some time for questions. So please feel free to utilize the chat. Um, if you would like to raise your hand or unmute um, to ask your question, I would be happy to have you do that at this moment. I think there were some messages in the chat from earlier. Kathleen? Yes. Hey, this is Bryce. I saw one that I can address, and it was Heather put in a, a question about should post-exposure prophylaxis vaccination be given with immunoglobulin? And I will tell you that we are not doing that here. Um, and just to paint a picture, this is we are a publicly funded STI clinic that post-COVID was struggling, and now we're dealing with um, identifying rashes and cases and vaccinating case and exposures that we on top of what we normally do. So I don't know that we would have the bandwidth to um, order and use immunoglobulin within the context of our clinic. And I will say that we vaccinated over 54 people and it has just been the vaccine. Um, and like, like Philip said earlier, the thing about the vaccine is it's it requires one dose and then a second dose 28 days later. So some of the STI clinics that are particularly problem focused only that don't do any type of pseudo primary care like HIV treatment or post exposure pro or pre exposure prophylaxis for HIV prep clinics may not be used to setting up follow up appointments. And that's been another issue that we've had to deal with here at the clinic with all of these post-exposure prophylaxis vaccinations, but hopefully that addresses Heather's question. Perfect, and it looks like there is a question here on if data is stratified, um, data that stratifies cases by race. And I think that was in response to something that you had mentioned, Dr. Chan, if you would like to respond to that. Wonderful. Yes, I have. Uh, I've seen some of the numbers from race. I apologize. I don't have the report right in front of me, uh, but they have looked at it in in the UK. I've seen that data. I haven't seen it for the US quite yet, uh, so I'm unsure. There was nothing that uh, was striking to me in terms of race ethnicity data yet. Okay, and then we have another question. Someone was just inquiring about chem sex, and I think what they were trying to say is BDSM, I think which was a part of Bryce's conversation. Um, so Bryce, do you wanna take the opportunity to kind of explain what those are a little more? Sure, uh, both of them are fetishes. They're, they're subpopulations, fetishes within, usually within the gay, bisexual, and other MSM community, but chemsex is spread into the heterosexual community as well. So it's not just something we own. Chemsex is basically when people engage in sex and sexual activity, um, either high or while using substances. Um, within the MSM community, it typically is crystal meth, but also can be GHB and can be oftentimes Viagra Cialis erectile dysfunction drugs are also part of that, as are poppers, the amyl nitrate that they snort. So typically that's what chemsex is. It's basically a fetishization of sex while high or doing drugs. And then BDSM is the bondage. I can't remember what the, the acronym actually stands for, but it's the bondage um, sadomasochist. I think SNM is sadomasochist, but it's, it's the subpopulation um, of both hetero, you know, both non-MSM and MSM folks who have rough sex. Think dominatrix, think of the leather harness, har the leather harnesses and those types of things. Um, so that's what I meant. And hopefully that clarifies the questions. Great. 
Great. And it looks like there's a question here on if there is any movement on the name change of this infection, if anyone has any information to provide on that. I don't have any further updates on that. I'm aware that the WHO is looking at that uh, and considering it. So I think more to come. I have a question, if you don't mind, for Bryce, actually. Bryce, I'm curious about your thoughts on this, seeing that you're uh, on the ground dealing with this. It kind of relates to my last point. I think in the beginning, many of us were hesitant to talk about this as a disease among gay and bisexual men. Uh, and I'm just wondering, I think to my last point I made, how are you, how are you thinking about it and, and the health department and others uh, on the ground there? in terms of outreach and advertising and messaging specifically, is this something that we need to up our game uh, in terms of reaching out specifically to MSM? Are you concerned that we're gonna overly stigmatize it? What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And I will say that part of being, the task force that I'm helping to lead um, for the national response is the, commu the community outreach and partner engagement. And we have been walking that very thin line of trying to let the affected subpopulations realize that this is an issue without giving ammunition to the general public that can be used for stigmatization. And that hasn't been easy. I will say that there are several things that CDC has put out, um, like how to do messaging and how to communicate about this without stigmatizing. They're all available on the website. We have reached out to event organizers um, with templates that they can use to send to their participants, just letting them know about this. So we have been trying to focus towards the gay, bisexual, and other MSM who seem to be most heavily affected. Uh, you know, I think of on the incident management call this morning, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but let's say that there's 230 cases in the United States right now. And of those, there's almost 200 that have gender and gender of sex partners listed, and 97, 98% of those are men who have sex with men, um, complicated by the fact that I think that there are about five that were gender female at birth, but we know that at least two of those were trans men. So it's, um, and I will also say that um, places like DC and other places are swamped with this. They're, oh, they were already struggling and they're really struggling with this. So the case report forms that the CDC is asking to be sent back after a uh, case has been either orthopox positive or monkeypox positive aren't coming in as quickly as the positive lab reports are. So there's a lot more to learn there. And I will say that we're already in discussions about trying to create language specifically for the BDSM and the chemsex community. Great, thank you. And it looks like Valerie Taylor has a question if you would like to unmute. Can everybody hear me? Okay, um, I'm not sure if uh, you all had already gone over this or not, so I apologize if you did. Um, regarding the vaccine, I know you were talking about the two doses and stuff. Is there, is it kind of like the flu where you're going to have to get it every year or is it just like two and done? It should just be two and done. So these vaccines are pretty long lasting. Again, I'm going to preference this by saying there's limited data on everything, uh, but we believe it should be two and done based on the historical experience with uh, with smallpox. Uh, so two and done, fingers crossed. Thank you. Great, and there's a question here for Abel. Can you elaborate a bit more on the biggest challenge with contacting sexual partners? Do you mean that it's been difficult to start an interview for exposure notification with these individuals, difficult collecting contact information for sexual partners from cases or something else? Yes, no, this is, and this is anecdotal um, from, from our local health jurisdictions, because we, like I mentioned before, um, the California Department of Public Health supports our local health jurisdictions. And so what we've been hearing from them is that because, uh, uh, at least from what we've been told that the partners of, of our positive patients um, engage in much like uh, what Bryce was mentioning earlier, um, bathhouses, orgies, and a lot of the partners are um, anonymous or meeting through uh, geolocating apps that um, are easily uh, deletable and stuff like that. So that's just what we're hearing from the field.
Great. And I think we'll take a couple more questions um, and then open the floor to if anyone else has any additional insight or experiences. Um, but let's see, our final question will be, would it be good a good idea to start to put monkeypox information in our risk reduction when speaking with a client? I can take that only because we've wrestled with this a lot, but yes, harm reduction, the way that we've couched um, a lot of the stuff that we've put out from CDC for the LGBTQ plus community has been in a harm reduction um, context. And so we realized, we knew before IML in Chicago and before some of these other events that us educating them and providing them with knowledge about what was going on would most not would most likely not make them cancel or change their plans, but make might make them do things differently in the moment. And it's all harm reduction. There's some things that are put that are in that list uh, on the in, on the document basically that's on the website that some people have scoffed at. It, it mentions things like mutual masturbation at least six feet away. It, it talks about being intimate with clothes on. So if there are pox, they, you don't come in contact with them. So it is in the context of harm reduction. And I'll, rem I'll remind you all that New York City during COVID actually promoted glory holes because it decreased the likelihood of the aerosolized or aerosol transmission of the COVID virus. So yes, I think that would be a great idea. Great, and I will open it up now to um, any of our participants. If you have any insights you would like to share or experiences with DIS and the monkeypox outbreak, um, please feel free to share those now. Kathleen, hey, this is—I I just saw a couple questions in the chat that I thought I would address. I think one is actually from David Harvey, and his specific question is. Where is CDC heading with the vaccine rollout for MSM at sexual health clinics? New York City and perhaps Chicago and LA are proceeding, perhaps with or without CDC, what's the latest? So the, this is a very good question and I am going to try and be as open and honest and transparent as I can be without getting into trouble. The CDC, there will be a national vaccine plan rolled out either later today or sometime tomorrow. It is something that was worked on feverishly over the weekend. It's something that the White House um, is really pushing for. So this will come out. Um, I also want to say that what's happening in New York City is not sustainable. And what I mean by that is we have a limited number of Genios vaccines. We have limited data about Genios vaccines and the other one, the, the ACAM 2000. Um, there is one thing we know, and that's that for HIV infected individuals, based on the paucity of data, the little data that we do have, they need to get the Genios vaccine, um, whether that's in the context of post exposure prophylaxis or in the context of um, pre exposure prophylaxis. Um, so, and like Dr. Chan already mentioned, the ACAM 2000 vaccine has a lot of side effects and is not that well tolerated, and there's been huge pushback from providers that we've networked with through NCSD, through the PTCs, through the AETCs that said there'd be no way in hell that they would give their patients ACAM 2000. So this, what's, what's happening is that we're trying to come up with a plan at the federal level that takes into account everything we know and some of the things that we don't know. Meanwhile, places like New York City and what's happening in Montreal, Montreal it's, it, they're, they're not limiting the vaccine to just HIV co-infected individuals. Um, and I don't know what they're using by criteria, but when this vaccine plan rolls out, it will have pretty clear criteria of who should be getting what one. Bryce, is that gonna include any resources specifically allocated to STD clinics to help do all this? I would have to say yes, just based on DC's experience. We've had no problem getting the Genios vaccine and we're actually, we're finding it we're also starting to use the TPOX or the treatment um, because CDC has said that through the FDA EAU that any guy, any man with genital lesions, especially really severe pox, is eligible for this treatment. So we're waiting for 12 doses to come through based on what we've seen here at the clinic. And I believe that's going to be, so I don't think that it's going to be an issue for the freestanding STI clinics, especially the freestanding STI clinics that are already dealing with this or are about to deal with this. So, so no new specific monies allocated for this purpose yet? Not yet that I know of. Again, I, I'm not, not that I know of, David. Okay. No, I, I appreciate that opportunity. That's a really important news. Thank you. 
This is Beth Butler from Melissa. Pennsylvania. Okay. Is there going to be any limit on Tecumerovac? Will that be a problem in getting that? Because if we're not going to do vaccinations, which is a better idea to do the antiretroviral, um, is that something that we would be able to do? In other words, testing people for monkeypox, I think we should also test them for syphilis and HIV at the same time. And then if they do have those lesions, hit them with a Tecumerovac and have that on hand for them at an STD clinic. Yeah, Beth, um, good to hear your voice. I do not know of any limitations on that medicine at this time. Again, I think that it's something that a lot of people are just realizing is available. And I think e there's even some, mis there's, there's, um, there's not a lot of clarity at the national level, but it just came out from the clinical folks that are running this outbreak that this can be used, can be acquired and used among, um, it's been mostly men who have sex with men, but men who have pox on their penis, and I'll give you the example of DC. So this will, it'll highlight a little bit of what you guys, what we're all talking about. The first case that we diagnosed here in the clinic, we saw um, the day after his rash started and we did not think it was monkeypox. We thought it was herpes. We swabbed him for HSV culture and we um, presumptively put him on acyclovir for his first clinical outbreak of herpes. A couple days later, it got much worse. He sent us a picture. We had him come back into clinic, basically. It was much worse. And between the time we first saw him to the time, the second time we saw him, this guy found out that one of his partners from a sex party in New York City um, was from Toronto and had been diagnosed with monkeypox. So he, the second time we saw him, it was very obvious this wasn't herpes, but he also was at the link to a case um, through a sex party in New York City. So that's where, you know, all of this other, especially if they're being seen in category of STI clinics, you can't not test them for other things. Another point that I'll say is that first case that we saw that we initially thought was herpes, he also ended up having chlamydia in his urethra. So he was also, he was diagnosed with monkeypox, but also had chlamydia um, based on that sex party in New York City. So that is one thing that I was going to say, and now I lost my train of thought for the other thing. So. But the other thing is, so does that have to come through the national stockpile like the vaccine, or can we begin to put that out on 340B that providers can get it? So in other words, making not only the vac make not only the testing avail widely available, okay, to those who definitely need to be testing individuals, but also making the Tecumerovac available easily that a facility can order it rather than having to go through us and then call CDC and then get it approved and, and blah, 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 while this individual is suffering, because this is really painful. I, the lesions look awful, especially some of them with also with the um, prostatitis that's going on with it too. So right now, Beth, I will say that we had to meet with our local EPIs and CDC on a call Friday to explain what was going on, and that's how we got the doses sent to us. Right now, my experience is that all of the vaccine and all of the treatments are coming from the national stockpile, and that requires both the local epidemiologist and CDC be involved. Philip, if you, have, if you know of anything else, uh, that could change. Um, they are expanding. Like Philip said earlier, they're trying to expand the monkeypox testing into commercial labs. I know that they've already expanded it well beyond the LRN lab network, but you know there are some people who feel that it's still not where it should be. Um, but as far as I know, Beth, what we've done here in DC is we have had to have um, conversations with both the local epidemiology folks and CDC to get both the vaccine and the treatment. So have we, and that's I think that's the next step. I, I would think the treatment step is the next step. I don't know if the vaccine is the step to make for this. I'm beginning to believe it's the treatment step. So it's the testing and the treatment. But if you test a lot of people, we're gonna find more cases, which we all know that happens. We're gonna find more interviews to do, but we've gotta be able to give somebody something as well. Yeah. Uh, you, I, oh, sorry, go, ahead, Phil. go ahead, Bryce. I just have one comment after you. I was just going to, Beth reminded me of the other thing that I was going to say that I lost my train of thought. The, uh, that gentleman that I just spoke to, his pox increased in number, the swelling increased, the pain increased. It got to a point where, and he was uncircumcised, it got to a point where he was unable to urinate because of the swelling. He wasn't able to retract his foreskin. So we actually had to work with a local emergency department to have him go in. Um, and it turns out that with a, a appropriate pain management, he was able to pass urine and didn't need to be catheterized, thank goodness. But to just to say that one thing, the couple hospitalizations that I know about in the United States of America around these cases have all been for pain management. 
Yeah, thank you, Bryce. I just wanted to make one quick point about uh, Tico Viramat, Tico as it's known, uh, if you're familiar, but it's actually only uh, indicated as an infectious disease physician. We did use it in our one patient that was hospitalized here in Rhode Island. It's really only indicated for folks with severe disease and people who are at high risk of severe disease. So that would include immunocompromise. And I just want to mention that this is, uh, that there's really, really, really limited data uh, with this medication. Uh, it's been studied in animal models only in some like case studies. Um, so just very limited data. Uh, I would not use it for an outpatient. Uh, in, so if an outpatient presented to me, this is not the medication that I would use. Uh, and someone that was out, you know, outpatient maybe had a little bit of pain uh, or even some pain, but didn't meet uh, criteria to be admitted. Uh, it can be given orally or IV. You know, if you look at the the CD pay, CDC page, and and there's at least one patient with neutropenia, so this is not an entirely benign drug. Uh, and also with the fact that there's really limited data, um, I would just caution people about thinking about this as a test and treat type approach. So, I just I think we need to see more data, you know, both on safety and efficacy. Uh, but certainly, if you have someone that's sick and certainly hospitalized, and certainly Bryce in the in the patient that that you mentioned, absolutely would use it 100%. But again, safe. We need to see the safety and the efficacy. I think of this medication. Uh, I would be careful about general widespread use. So more aptly go with the vaccination for those who are. Yes, but yes. specifically the Genios. Um, Genios, <laughs> right? Not the Amcam. No, I know that. I think, okay, I, I, the Genios. <laughs> Bryce said it, I guess maybe my opinion still came across about ACAM 2000. I mean, I think it's one of those things you got to wait. It's all about the risks and the benefits, right? Risks and the benefits. I mean, you know, if monkeypox had a mortality rate of 10%, there's no doubt that we should use the ACAM 2000. But I think we're just seeing such low, we're seeing low mortality. Um, I think that we have to judiciously use our genios and I think that we'll be okay. And I think, you know, excited to see the plan that's coming out. Uh, my guess is it will focus on uh, immunocompromised, higher risk folks to prioritize, which it probably should. Um, but I think the Genios vaccine is the way to go, both post-exposure as well as you know pre-exposure preventative. Uh, I think that we'll we'll be in a good place once we get some more vaccine supply. Thank you all, and I do want to just highlight one comment in the chat um, before we close. Um, Emily Fussell says that she has created a clinical interview form for her DIS team based on CDC interview guide um, that they use to conduct a presumptive when we swab. Um, that way we have all required information before we know PT is confirmed in case we can't get a hold of them again. Um, and I believe we will be sharing that information if she or that interview form if she is okay with that. Um, and with that said, I just wanted to plug uh, the NCSD Monkeypox Command Center one more time. Um, this has many resources, news updates um, related to monkeypox. If you do have any resources that you would like us to share, um, please feel free to reach out. It looks like Jenny has just put her email in the chat. Um, so we would love to hear from you guys. And thank you again to all of our speakers. All righty, guys, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.